Well, as most of you are aware, we, we uh, Robbie and I, had to go down for a funeral in um, California yesterday. We drove down Friday, came back yesterday, and, and um, you know, right about 12 30 this morning. So if I start dozing off, you know why. Um, but it was, a, you know, and many of you just kind of give you a little background. Uh, Greg was a friend of my older son, Wes. They went to Bible school together, uh, Life Pacific Bible College down in San Dimas, California. And um, Greg was probably one of the only colleagues of my son when he decided to kind of go off the rails and go his own way. Greg was the only one that really stayed with him of all his friends in college. You know, always tried to encourage him. Greg was very, uh, you know, had was a very strong Christian, had a, a mission in life. He knew he had to, he had to serve people to, to, to help out in any way he could. And it, it's an interesting story how, you know, he got his, um, you know, bachelor's degree at Life Pacific. So he was very well trained in Pentecostal theology, you know, it's a four square college. And then went on to his master's, and I forget which college he went to, but he ended up being ordained a Lutheran priest of the Missouri Synod. So the funeral, uh, he was an assistant pastor at, the, uh, at a uh, church in Claremont, the St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Claremont. And he was an, uh, it was interesting, the funeral was full Lutheran liturgy. It was a long funeral. But the pastor had a, a lot to say, and it was a, a beautiful message of the gospel. At the same time, uh, uh, an excellent eulogy because they were close friends. And that's the thing about Greg. I don't think he had casual friends, okay? I think probably I was the most casual he had because I hardly ever saw him. I think I met the guy twice. But we talked a lot. You know, we prayed for my, my you know, continuing to pray for my oldest son. And he stated, and I don't say this to brag, this is what he said. He enjoyed watching our sermons online from our little church plant here. And it gave him great comfort when he was, after he was diagnosed with uh, colon cancer. And he was, he's 43. And the testimony he left behind was a beautiful one. I'll just give you one example, which convicted me, okay? And every year, Claremont has what they call their Harvest Festival. I'm not sure when it is. I assume it's around... Halloween, but you know the city the city cannot call it a anti Halloween thing, but they call it their harvest festival, and the Lutheran Church normally would put up a booth where they had games of different sorts, but Greg says no i 'm not going to have any part of that so what he did he in this booth, this tent they had, they had the game set up, but in the middle he had a table, he put a cross and a big sign that says, "Let us pray for you and he sat there. And people came up, and he prayed with them. This shows his Pentecostal training. Okay, you can tell he knew the, the word. And uh, oftentimes, the pastor would talk about sp- spiritual insights Greg had. Well, Greg knew how to how to use the Holy Spirit because he was trained that way. And such a testimony, something that pe- something people would remember. People would. Uh, for, you know, for years, we'd say, oh, yeah, I remember this guy. And something that you heard, and a lot more at this funeral than I have at other funerals, was a lot of people saying, why did God take him so soon? He was only 43. He left behind his wife and a four-year-old daughter, you know, Amelia's age. And I could relate because my first wife died when my son Wes was four. So I could relate what she was going through. And I chatted with her, and I gave her comfort and so forth. But people were asking that question. It it, it seems like, and you can tell, they had no clue that God had plans. Now, we don't know what those plans are sometimes. Why did did God take Greg at 43? I don't know. I'm not going to even pretend like I do. I have no clue. I don't even have an idea. I mean, sometimes I'll think, well, I think it's to reach somebody or do this or do that. I don't even have that. But I rest assured that there was a plan of some sort. 
and that he, that God had more due to his legacy as opposed to his life as well. How that works again, I don't know. I don't, I'm not trying to say it. But it's astounding sometimes what people will say as if they were God themselves. And you hear it a lot. Oh, it was a shame that God should have had no business taking him that age or no taking her that age and so on and so forth. And it even extends to the crucifixion. I didn't realize just how the world is getting more and more upset at the whole concept of Good Friday and Easter. Okay? I'm not in the middle of it anymore. But it's, it's amazing. Paul had said that the message of the gospel is foolishness to those who perish. And there are people out there that are showing their foolishness at such a grand level. Uh, you know, of course, you have your atheists who claim that, oh, I've never seen God, therefore he doesn't exist. And everything around us, all creation, was created by blind chance. Intelligence design is impossible. And this logic, which Paul does describe in Romans 1, and we're not going to read it, but he describes it in Romans 1, it's pretty easy to refute because you sit there and say, oh, what about this building? You don't believe in the person who, who the people who built it because you don't see them? Is this building not a product of intel, intelligent design? Well, uh, uh, and I've had this conversation with people. Uh, uh, well, that's different. No, it's not different. Because the universe, the world around us, your own body is much more complex than this building is. Yeah. Okay? And, you know, we've talked about this before with computer programs that... I've known many computer programmers in my time. I actually used to be a programmer myself. And nobody I've ever known, myself included, has ever written a program and got it right on the first try. I always had to go back and debug it. Everyone does. And even when you debug it, there's always a flaw hidden somewhere. You know, ask anybody that's programmed something to control their lights, and when the program's running, suddenly the lights go off. Oops, I guess we did something wrong here. Yes. Yet God got it right on the first time. Okay? They're interesting people. You've got the agnostics who claim, well, I believe in a supreme being of some sort, uh, but it's an impersonal being. He doesn't really care about, or it doesn't really care about what's going on here. It just started the world in, in motion and then it's going off to do its own thing. And it doesn't really matter what religion you follow because all roads lead to God and all the religions are essentially the same. Really, have you ever studied this? Well, no, I don't have to. Why not? You might find that religions are not the same. Oh, there may be similarities on the surface. They all have, they have a lot of them have ceremonies and they have certain things the way they do things. But if you really look... I'm sorry, there's very few, there's no, I'm sorry, Hinduism and Christianity are not identical by any stretch of the imagination. Even the closest relation to Christianity, Judaism, they're not identical. Okay, they may claim it, but Islam does not preach or does not believe in the same God the Jews and the Christians do. And there's a lot of similarities, but no, they're, they're contradictory. And here's the thing, if this big impersonal being who truly didn't care, why did he take so much care to make sure this planet was placed at the right distance from the sun, had the right composition, the right location in this part of the galaxy, so that all the conditions of life happen to be just right? Now, are you telling me that's random chance? What I'm telling you right now that is statistically impossible. Okay. Well, there is a chance, one in you know, 15 billion or something like that, yeah, I got a better chance of winning the lottery. Okay, sorry, I don't take, I don't buy it because it happened. It's here. It's in front of us. And this is the thing. It's like a lot of it that it boils down to is they don't want that supreme being because they don't want to be accountable. They want to run their own lives. And the really scary and most disturbing ones are the arrogant so-called believers who spout similar foolishness. They say, yes, we're Christians. So yeah, we, we believe in God. But at the same time, they deny some of Christianity's most basic cornerstones. 
For example, the Bible is not the inspired word of God, but contains the words of God. Uh, and somehow they don't know which are which. Or somehow they figure it out and they say, well, Jesus said this, but he didn't say that. Even though the Bible has it all in red letters. Well, the question is, oh, well, how do you know what he said and what he didn't? Were you there? Well, some of them actually say, oh, yes, I was there in a previous life. Okay. So when you have those pictures of you shaking hands with Jesus, you managed to bring a camera back with you? you know? Is this what you're trying to tell me? Okay. Well, and they, and they go further. They don't. The, the virgin birth, that's a myth. Huh? What do you mean? Well, they, they were trying to cover up a rape. She was, Mary was probably raped by a Roman soldier. And so uh, that's why church art has blonde hair, blue eyes. It's like uh, Romans didn't have blonde hair, blue eyes. Okay. And Jesus didn't look like in the church art. Okay. God, is, this one I wonder. Did you ever read your Bible when they sit there and say, Jesus never claimed that he was God? We talked about that actually the last couple of weeks. He did, unmistakably, undeniably. Um, he never claimed that he's returning. You know, he said that. <laughs> the disciple says, well, you know, tell us the time of, you know, the coming, of your coming and the end of the age. He didn't say, oh no, you're wrong, I'm not coming back. He went and answered the question. These are the signs of when I'm coming back. Behold, I come quickly. That's Jesus talking. Okay. Well, this is, a, this is one I've talked about many times. God is only a God of love. He loves us all. So therefore, it's all love, no judgment. And we're going to look at this last assertion today. Okay. It may seem rather odd since we are talking about the crucifixion. But it's interesting to look at what some people's twisted view of what God's love is supposed to be like. And there's a growing number of these supposed Christians who are suddenly taking exception to the idea of Jesus dying on the cross as a sacrifice to atone our sins. Okay? There's one, so, uh, let me quote one so called minister of the gospel. Crucifixion is not something that God is orchestrating from upstairs. The pervasive idea of an abusive God father who sends his own kid to the cross is so God could forgive people is nuts. That's a so-called minister saying this. Okay? That basically God is an abusive father. All right? Crucifixion. This person considers crucifixion to be a first century lynching, an enactment of our human hatred, affecting nothing in God's plan of redemption except to show where hatred leads. I can't deny there's a little bit of truth in that, but that's not the whole truth. The fact is, yes, it does show where man's sin leads him to, denying the divinity of Christ, denying their Savior, and thinking they could shut him up by killing him. And we went through that whole thing about the trial, how illegal it was and so forth. Yeah, it is an enactment of human hatred, but it does have a purpose. Okay. In essence, God has already forgiven us since he can because he loves us. That's the assertion. Jesus' death had nothing to do with it. It was all the fault of the Jews and a wishy-washy Roman magistrate. Professing to be wise, they become fools. That's a good example of this. Now, while it's true, God is a God of love, we're not going to deny this. This view ignores the fact that God is also righteous and just. Okay? He has also made it clear that by, without the shedding of blood, there is no remissions of sin. That the penalty of sin is death and that no human on their best day can meet God's perfect standards. It's in the word. You cannot deny it. Period. End of discussion. And yet God loved us so much that he made a way to reconcile man to himself by placing the sins of the world onto a sinless man. That was Christ who then died and rose again from dead thus satisfying the justice of God. But the thing is, these so-called experts don't believe that God should have worked that way. Okay? God, it should be heaven, should be a free-for-all. Everyone should end up in heaven. Okay? But that's not what the Bible tells us. That's, what the na not, that's not the nature of God. 
So if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and go to Luke 23. While we're heading there, there is another little thing that some people don't uh, think about. But this denial of the need of a sacrificial death kind of adds fuel to another fire. And this fire is that Jews deserve to be treated with contempt and hatred because they killed Jesus. Okay? This is a blatant lie from the pit of hell, guys. We've uh, talked about this before. This has caused pretty much a good portion of the anti-Semitism of the past 2,000 years. Okay? All the way from the Spanish Inquisition during the Middle Ages to the persecution of the Jews by so-called Christians in the Russian Empire. Okay? In fact, the Jewish Jews were reportedly referred to by the imperial authorities in Russia as Christ killers. Okay? You had the Holocaust in Germany. Though there is a different reason there, but a lot of upstanding Christians in Germany look the other way because of the latent anti-Semitism based on the fact that, oh no, the Jews were the ones that killed Jesus. Okay, And up to today, there are modern believers who refuse to support Israel. Same reason. They think that the church took Israel's place. No, that sorry, that is not what the Bible tells us. In fact, the Bible tells us that we were grafted in. Paul mentions this in Romans, that we all, that, you know, the, the promise that God gave to Abraham and all the Jewish patriarchs stands firm today. I will bless those that bless you. I will curse those that curse you. And we see it. If you want to put blame for Christ's death, the event we are about to read about, if you want to put blame, point your finger at yourself. Because the reason Jesus died was for our sins. Yours, mine, everybody's. We're all in this great, great plot together. Okay? All of us sinned, which is all. All means all. Okay? We are the reason Christ died, why he underwent what we are about to describe. Now, if Adam had not sinned, if none of us had sinned, okay, there had been no need for Jesus to be on earth. No need whatsoever, because God would never have left. Okay? There would have been no need for sacrifice. There would have been no need for a cross. No, it's because we sinned, that need became real. And yeah, the Jews had their part in our Savior's death. But they were also guilty of sin, just like we were. We all must share the blame. So what we're about to read is not a record of child abuse or reckless hate. But believe it or not, of the love of God in action. A love so deep that he was willing to pay any price. And let nothing get in its way. So we're in Luke 23, starting down in verse 26. If you remember also, we just, you know, Pilate basically handed him over for execution. So now we pick up from that point. Verse 26, Luke 23. Now as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country. And on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And a great multitude of people followed him, and women also mourned and lamented him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren wombs that never bore, and the breasts which never nursed. And they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us. For they do, not, for they do these things For if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? Okay, so let's stop there for a second. Note that Luke really doesn't go into a lot of detail concerning this whole process of crucifixion. Okay, there is a lot more going on than Luke Luke, uh, mentions. And to be honest, none of the Gospels do. And there's a very good reason for this, because the intended audience, remember this was written within, you know, the first, you know, all the Gospels within the first 50 years after Jesus' death. Uh, John was the last one to write. But the intended audience, every one of them, were very familiar with crucifixion. Okay? 
They lived in the Roman Empire. Crucifixion was a very common execution for criminals. So everybody knew what they were talking about. Now we don't have to describe it for future generations, but we have descriptions of it. Okay, for example, the, the first who developed per, the, 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 the process of crucifixion were the Persians around 300 BC. And for a really oddball reason. At that point, influenced by the Greeks, they believed that there were four elements, earth, air, fire, and water, and they were all sacred, okay? So they felt that crucifying somebody, instead of hacking their head off or doing something like that, well, you hang them up so that all the elements can actually purge the person and not be defiled by the dead body. It's really kind of a bizarre reasoning, but that's why the Persians developed it. But the Romans, and I'm going to put this in quotes, perfected it, okay? They perfected this process, meaning that they created the most painful mode of execution the world had ever seen. Because they looked at it more as not just a punishment, because when a person, and, and this is literally how a lot of them thought, when the person dies, they're no longer in pain. No, 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 you need to prolong their death and make it as painful as possible. How twisted can we can become, but that was the logic behind it. And the English language derives the word excruciating from the word crucifixion, meaning that they acknowledge that it's a slow form of painful suffering. Excruciating pain, think about that, okay? So as I mentioned, by the time of Christ, it's very common, the Romans really liked using it, and in Judea, they used it an awful lot simply because it was a great deterrent to people who rebelled. Okay? Um, according to Josephus, uh, after Herod the Great died, the Roman governor of Syria, which does include Judea, uh, crucified 2,000 men in order to quell an uprising. Blink of an eye, they're dead. They're all crucified. Okay? Every large town had a hill outside they had was specifically there along the main highway with lots and lots of places set up for crucifixions. Lots of them. Okay, today, no one knows exactly where Calvary was, but if you go to Israel, there's one place which kind of looks like a skull, you know, Calvary or Golgotha means the place of the skull. And it's in basically behind a bus station. Okay, and a lot of people who've been there, a lot of pastors have been there, said that's a very... A fitting place because the actual place of crucifixion was very similar. It wasn't a bus station, but it was along the main road where people were walking back and forth, going into Jerusalem and out, and it was there in your face. You could not miss it. And that was the point. They wanted people to see if you uh, rebel against Rome, if you are a thief, if you are a murderer, if you break any crime we consider worthy of death, this is where you're going to end up. And if you sat, stood and watched it, you would see why people were very, no, I don't want anything to do with this. Most people weren't willing to die for it, not that way. According to Josephus, again, uh, when Titus had uh, taken Jerusalem in AD 70, he crucified so many people that there was no wood left for crosses and no place left to set them up. Romans really good at this. And by, you know, from the time of the first Roman occupation to the time of Christ, Rome had already crucified more than 30,000 victims in and around Judea. Okay? Yeah, the readers of the Gospels in the, in the first century church knew exactly what they were saying. No descriptions necessary. Unfortunately, we kind of need to understand a little bit, little bit more. Because one thing, if you watch movies like Ben-Hur, for example, or any other movie, The Greatest Story Ever Told, or Jesus of Nazareth, any of these movies that were made uh, about Jesus and about his life, really, really candy coat the crucifixion, and for good reason. Uh, the only one I remember who actually approached it was Mel Gibson's uh, The Passion of the Christ, and that was rated R for a reason, yeah. okay? And believe it or not, because we have a rule in our house that we don't watch rated R movies, I have never seen that movie for that reason. But I've heard, yes, it's probably the most graphic representation of the crucifixion made, but even it falls short 
of the actual event. And we're going to hopefully not go into gory detail, but I want you to understand what Jesus went through. What was the price he actually paid? Now, some of you, this may be old news. You may have heard this before. Bear with me. Okay. A lot of people, this, they, 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 they may not have heard this described because a lot of people just don't like talking about it. It is, I'm, I'm going to make it clean, so if you have a squeamish stomach, don't worry about it. Okay? Bathrooms are back there, by the way, if you need that. And there's a trash can right there. Um, but remember, if you miss, not only do you have to clean up your own, you have to clean up mine and everybody else's in this room. Okay. As a baseline, let's look at Jesus himself. Let's turn the clock back to the Last Supper. Jesus had just finished the Last Supper. We can pretty much assume at this point that Jesus was a man of excellent health. He was a carpenter, which means he was pretty buff. He exercised a lot. He walked all over Galilee and Judea, and so was very strong. Uh, he ate healthy, like a typical uh, first century Jew. So we can assume, as a baseline, Jesus was a man in the prime of life and the prime of health. Okay? Now, the first signs of stress occurred in the Garden of Gethsemane. Okay? We talked about this a few weeks ago. Luke mentioned that Jesus appeared to be sweating great drops of blood. Let me explain that already. This is a condition known as hemohydrosis, is when the capillaries within the uh, sweat glands start to break and the blood gets mingled with the sweat and it looks like you're sweating blood. Okay, it's a rare, but it does happen. And this also, and we didn't mention this last time, it also makes the skin very, very tender. So like if, some, if something hits like that, Normally that wouldn't hurt, but with hemohydrosis, yes, it would start to hurt and start to hurt more as the time went on. So his physical condition, due to stress, yes, stress does this, started to go downhill. Okay? So they arrested him, took him to the palace of the high priest. The temple guards had blindfolded him and started punching him. Now, we talk, kind of addressed this a couple weeks ago, is that when you punch a person and they see it coming, they roll with it. You know, they'll, they'll try to move away from it. They, you may land the blow, but it's not gonna hurt that as much as it would if you didn't see it coming. So when he's blindfolded, people are punching him. He's gonna be hurt a lot more than a normal person would, okay? And then you've got the tender skin from a hemohydrosis, and his injuries are gonna become extremely severe, okay? It's going to be painful. In fact, it's a good chance they hit him so much that one or both of his eyes may be swelling shut, so he can't really see too well. Of course, Isaiah talks about a, a person as a prophecy that the Messiah is a man marred beyond recognition. That's my paraphrase. Basically, people are looking at him. They can't recognize who he is. Okay? Also keep in mind, Jesus had not eaten or drank anything for almost 12 hours. And at this point, he had not slept for almost 24 hours. So that's starting to tear his conditions down. Okay? So now he's, he's in front of Pilate. He's probably in pretty bad shape. Maybe the swelling's gone so he can see. He's able to talk. He's able to answer. Pilate talks with him, says, no, he's innocent. Sends him over to Herod. Herod says, yeah, he's innocent. Sends it back to Pilate. And... Herod's soldiers heaped physical and verbal abuse on him. So Jesus was in a pretty pitiable state by the time he got back to Pilate the, the, the final time. And I'm sure one of the reasons why Pilate showed him to the people, he, the guy looked like he was beaten to a pulp, and they're saying, behold the man. And he was hoping to extract some pity from the crowd. Look, the guy's beaten up. What threat is he? He's innocent. He's, you know... He's no threat. Now, we got this murderer you guys want. That's a threat. This guy, what are you talking about? And no, they were screaming for his head. They said, no, crucify him, crucify him. His blood be upon ours and our children. Crucify him. And as we know, Pilate relented and the process of execution began. And it was a process. Okay, so the first thing by the Roman law, Jesus was scourged. Okay, 
basically taken uh, a scourging was not a simple beating. Some people think it's just taking a whip. No, it's more than the whip. Uh, the scourge was actually the process and the whip, the name of the type of whip that they used. It had multiple thongs of leather or rope. And in, within that leather and rope, there were metal balls, bones, and metal spikes that when it hit, they would literally rip the f- flesh off your bone. Okay? During such a flogging, okay, a victim is tied to a post. Basically, there's a post. He's got his hands up tied to this post. His back is basically bare all the way from his waist all the way up. And the guy's just sitting there wailing away on him. Now, we don't know how many uh, strikes he had. Jewish um, tradition was 39, 40, minus one for mercy. Okay, Romans, they really didn't have any limits, but we never heard how many. It doesn't say in the scripture. Um, but every time it happened, more and more skin got ripped off. Muscle fiber, bone was being exposed. Bleeding was becoming very, very profuse. At many times... At this point, the victim would start fainting because the blood pressure is falling. And when you have low blood pressure, and anyone who's ever experienced that knows you get very faint and very weak. Okay? And what's happening is he's essentially going into shock. All right? Now, according to Matthew's gospel, the Roman soldiers then placed a crown of thorns on his head. Okay? And they put a robe on his back. Now, the robe actually helped the, the blood to clot. It was like putting a bandage on a wound, and the thorn went right over his skull, okay, straight down, not just a little thing, it actually went completely around, and these thorns poked into the forehead, to the scalp, and anyone's ever sustained a minor head injury, like you cut yourself, and it looks like you're dying because you're bleeding to death, okay, that's because the blood vessels are right on the surface between the bone and the skin, and... (laughs) This is not fun to have happen to you. You start bleeding. Bleeding's going everywhere. It uh, pokes into nerves. So you now get pain. And the pain's not going to go away anytime soon. Um, they hit him in the head to make the thorn, the crown of thorns go deeper into the skin. And they belittle him, they spit on him, they rip the robe off his back at one point, and so now the bleeding on his back starts over, and now he's really in bad shape. Remember, a few hours before, he was in perfect health. Now, his position, his condition is getting critical. You know, because of severe blood loss, Jesus is probably in shock. And despite all this, he was forced to carry his execution instrument. Now, you know, a lot of people say it was a full cross. No, it wasn't. Okay? That's not how they did things back then. What it was was the cross beam. They referred to this as the patabulum. And it weighed about 80 to 100 pounds. Okay? And someone of Jesus' build, it, under normal conditions, would have been a heavy load, but he could have carried it. Okay? But this is part of the humiliation. Now, in his current condition... This wasn't going to happen. And for those that say, well, wait a minute, the movies show him carrying a whole cross. The answer is, even for a healthy man, that was weighing about 400 pounds. And as we're going to see, there's a reason why they did it this way. They, they didn't have to put a cross in the ground. There was already something in the ground waiting for it. So we'll get to that in a second. And the distance he traveled was about four or 650 yards wasn't that far but because of the loss of blood because of his physical condition he could not carry it now the romans had a law that if you there was a burden that had to be carried and that roman did not want to carry it he could take the flat of his sword and touch any random person on the on the road with the flat of the sword and you had to carry that roman's load for one mile Okay, now you know the, uh, the origin of the phrase, go the extra mile. Okay, because that's what Jesus was talking about in the uh, Sermon on the Mount. He said, if he asks you to go one mile, offer to go two. And that's what he's referring to. And so you pick up all this guy's stuff, you carry it along. When you reach one mile, you were able to put it down. And then he go, you know, if he was rested, he'd pick it up. Or if he go after some other victim and say, no, I want you to carry it. And this was the, what was happening at this point is Jesus clearly wasn't going to carry the load. The soldiers were not going to carry it. So they looked around. They happened to see this guy who happened to be into town for the Passover, one Simon of Cyrene. 
and he was enlisted to carry this 80 to 100 pound piece of wood. Now, let's look at this guy for a second, the Simon of Cyrene. Um, as I mentioned, this was the Passover. He came the area, from the area of Cyrene, which today is Lib Libya in North Africa, around Tripoli. And he was probably one of the Jews that lived far away. And as like any good Jew, he had to come to Jerusalem for the Passover. And so distance he traveled, over 800 miles. Okay, And now he was a participant in an execution, which was the most unexpected thing to happen. He wasn't even thinking about it. And in any, many ways, it was a humiliating experience because people might think he's the one that's going to be executed. Okay. Well, it's interesting because we hear about, well, we don't hear about Simon again, but we hear about a legacy that Simon left because he's brought into personal contact with Jesus. Now, the Gospels don't tell us anything. It doesn't say if Jesus and him had a conversation. Probably not. Jesus probably wasn't, didn't feel like talking. But he could have had a conversation. He, Simon could have been aware of who this Jesus was and was intrigued by what was going on here. What we do know is that Mark identifies him as the father of Alexander and Rufus. Okay? Now, Mark wrote his gospel to Romans. That was the, 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 his target audience. And the way he wrote it, he assumed that the Romans' readers knew who Alexander and Rufus was. And a Christian named Rufus was greeted by Paul in Romans 16, 13. So it's possible, and we don't know this, but it's possible. The evidence kind of points that this Simon of Cyrene was saved. He had two boys, Alexander and Rufus, and his legacy, they were saved, and they were well known among the early church. Because that's why Mark addressed him. You know, you know, Simon, he's the father of Alexander and Rufus, and moves on. And of course, everyone reading is like, oh, yeah, I know who he is. Okay. So before Simon met Jesus, an interesting little point here, okay? He had religion and devotion. He was a devout Jew. He was ready for the Passover. He knew what was going on here. But after he met Jesus, he hit reality and salvation, okay? Now, we, again, I don't know this for certain. Scholars are still debating it, but the evidence points in that direction that this was one of those defining moments in this man's life that he saw what was happening and did it in a spiritual about face, transforming his life into the service of the Lord. And I like to think of this because it's another example of that God can use the unexpected and the difficult situations, even humiliating situations, to bring people to the Savior. So, Simon was there, but he wasn't the only one present. Public executions, as you can imagine, did, did gather crowds. There were the morbid-minded that kind of watched what was going on. It's like the guys driving down the freeway and you see an accident on the other side and you see a, a yellow sheet over a car and you're getting up there and everybody has to slow down to look. Oh, is there a body? I can't see it. And they're about to cause an accident themselves because they're so, so busy rubbernecking. But it's amazing how many people are attracted to this kind of thing. And the crucifixion was no exception. And there were a lot of, you know, there were a lot of Jews there who were pilgrims. That was part of the great multitude that Luke is talking about. And there was a group of women who had followed Jesus, and they were crying. They were weeping. They were lamenting. And they're saying, oh, Jesus, should never have happened. These were devoted followers. And then in the back of their minds, they're thinking, what happened? You are supposed to be the savior of the universe, and look what's happening to you. Uh, and as far as the gospel records mention, there was no single woman who was an enemy of Jesus, as far as the gospel record mentioned. And Jesus was never an enemy of womankind. Sorry, feminists. The Bible probably was the first where feminism was raised. In Roman times, women were nothing. They were property at best. And if you look through the teachings of the New Testament, you see how women were raised up beyond that. Brothers and sisters in Christ. Treat women, you know, think about, you know, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church because he gave his life for them. 
he, nowadays we think, oh, that's really a nice sentiment. It looks good in a Hallmark card. Back then, that was a radical change of paradigm, as they say in the edu- education world. A change of view. Because if you were married, the only reason you were married was so you could have kids, have a male heir especially. Love had nothing to do with it. Okay? Love had nothing to do with it. And in and, and, and basically Paul saying, not only are you going to love your wife, you're willing to die for your wife. And that blew people's minds off. And if feminists would read that properly, we would see, wow, Jesus does care about women. It does. He was fighting a culture that put women, not forget second class citizens, maybe just one step above slaves. Okay? Jesus saying, no. They are your sisters in Christ. All his teachings and his redemption have done much to dignify and elevate women. His news of his birth was shared with a Jewish maiden. His death was witnessed by grieving women. And the good news of his resurrection was announced to the first, to, the first person was to a woman, Mary Magdalene. We'll get to that later. Now, Jesus... He's, he's seeing their crying. He, he knows it. Okay? He's emphasizing with them. He's appreciating their sympathy. But he used his strength to kind of teach them a little bit more. He's basically saying, you're crying over one man's death. I got news for you. You're wasting tears right now. He's looking ahead 40 years to when the Romans are going to destroy Jerusalem and wipe out the temple and destroy the entire nation. And it was a judgment that was completely justified. We've already talked about that. And he's saying, oh, man, if you only knew what it was going to be like for women and children, they would be suffering the most with the Roman siege of AD 70 hit. And this fact was supported by history. Okay, according to Josephus, the Romans attempted to starve the Jews into submission, and hungry men defending their city took food from their suffering wives and children. That was the prevailing attitude. None of this, no, I'm going to die for my family. And they even killed and ate their own flesh and blood. That was, 30, that was 40 years ahead. Jesus saw it, and he's telling them, don't cry for me. Don't weep for me. Weep for the future. You do. I've been telling you, you have no idea what's going to happen. He mentions the green tree. That was his talking about the the nation of Israel. That was what Israel was like during his time on earth. It was a time of blessing. It was a time of opportunity. That's why the tree was green. It had lots of leaves and so forth. It should have been a time of fruitfulness, but it did not. It became a dry tree, only fit for the fire. That's where it was going to go. So his last words to the women was another prophecy. So now they reach the place of execution, the place of the skull, in Latin Calvary or in uh, Aramaic Golgotha. So now we're in verse 32. There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they were crucified, and the criminals, one on right hand and other, the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. They divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him coming and offering him sour wine, saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription was also written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save us, or save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing that you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be in me, be with me in paradise. So here we are at the place of execution. All right. Jesus is able to throw that cross beam down. Now, here on Golgotha, what, they, what were found were these 
posts. They looked like posts. They were all over this hill, already permanently put in. These were referred to as stipes. And what it was that, you know, you, the, the person came in, they put, the, put that uh, cross beam down. They would force the victim to lay on his back on the cross beam. Of course, remember what his back's like. So now there's more bleeding, there's dirt getting rubbed in there. And then they nail his hands to that cross beam. Okay? Now, again, people would sit there and say, well, you know, it's impossible if you nail a person's hands here, it won't hold the weight. And they're absolutely right. In the Greek, the term hands also includes this part of the wrist. So basically, what they would do is put a huge nail. We're talking seven to nine inches long, about three eighths to half an inch in diameter, and they would run it right here through a gap in the two uh, uh, bones from the arm. Okay, one on the right, one on the left. And this would give that bone strength in order to, um, you know, to hold the body against gravity. It would also pierce a nerve that would start sending shooting pains up and down the arms. Okay, and that would not stop. And then once he was, he was uh, nailed into place, they would pick up that thing and they have the body along with it. They had ladders and they would hang it, hold it up, and there was a notch in the center that basically fit in the top of the stipes. And then... Pfft, that's where it was. They would secure his feet in a very similar way. Church art actually, actually gets this one right. Crossing the feet like this, and again, putting the nails right through it. But this is at the base. The feet, the feet were, uh, again, pushing against gravity, so there was not a lot of damage there. Then on top of his head, they put a, a thing called a titulus, which is essentially was the, uh, the official government declaration of what this guy had done, why he was there. If he was there for murder, it would say this is a murder. They'd have his name and they'd say this is a murderer. So Jesus had it up there in three languages, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew or Aramaic. Um, Latin was the official language of Rome. That was their government language. Greek was what a good portion of the population spoke. Aramaic was probably what most of the population spoke, and quite a few were bilingual. So everyone knew this is why that guy is hanging up there. And all it said was, you know, the king of the Jews. Okay? So now, he's, and, the, and this, this stipes, this, this post he's on now, we're not talking a smooth piece of wood. It's been out there, it's been weathered, it's splintery. So as soon as his back's on it, it's going to do more damage to his back. He's got pain going up and down his arms, pain going up and down his legs from the nails that are in his feet. Now, here's an interesting point. Luke doesn't mention this, but the other Gospels do. There's a, there was a charitable group within Jerusalem at this time who would go to these executions. They were women, and they would offer to give the victim a mixture of wine and myrrh. Okay? And what this was was essentially a simple anesthetic. If you drank it, it would kind of take the edge off the pain. It was viewed as, as a merciful thing. And it's interesting to note that Jesus took a taste of it and then essentially spit it out and says, no, I don't want any. He knew it would have eased the pain. He said, no, I am not. Despite my thirst, despite the fact that he was probably just dehydrated, despite his blood loss, he would not drink that concoction. Talk about love. A lot of people over, uh, skip over that because they don't understand its significance. He knew what he was in for, and he was going to face that pain head on. So now he's on the cross. Gravity pulls him down. His arms get stretched. His shoulders and his elbows are dislocated, causing more pain. Okay? He's rubbing up against the wood, rough wood, so his, his wounds are getting raw. He's going into even more pain. His knees, and the Romans knew what they were doing. His knees were fixed at about a 45-degree angle, okay, like this. And if you've ever tried squatting for any length of time, even for five minutes, just, you know, sitting like this, okay, and just holding your own weight up with your thighs, you will know that after five minutes, the pain is incredible. 
Well, he's forced into that position for more than five minutes. We're talking hours. Okay? And when you are crucified like this, okay, what happens is you cannot breathe properly. Okay? The diaphragm is this muscle at the base of your of your lungs. When it's stretched down, that allows air to come in. When you exhale, it pushes back up, makes your lung capacity lower, pushes the air out. When you're hanging like this, your diaphragm's low, so the air comes straight in, but you can't breathe out again. So to breathe out, you have to pull yourself and push yourself up so you can, your diaphragm moves up, the air goes out, and you can take another breath in. And of course, Remember all the pain he's going through. Notice his, his joints are becoming dislocated. This is not an easy thing to do. And this probably explains why Jesus, when he was on the cross, his statements were pretty brief. Because he had to pull himself up. Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. Okay, And he's saying, he's saying this, you know. It is finished. Notice every statement from the cross. He's not giving a sermon from this cross at any time. It's short, sweet statements. And what's happening is slow suffocation. Slow suffocation. Yet, he takes the time to overcome the pain. The first words out of his mouth, once on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. Not only is he practicing what he taught, forgive others, love one another, but he's fulfilling a prophecy, making intercession for the transgressors. That prophecy is found in Isaiah 53. Jesus was put on that cross about 9 a.m., and he remained on the cross until 3. You had the two criminals next to him. The Greek here basically says that these were uh, ones who used violence to rob openly. So we're not talking about a thief breaking in to a house or something. We're talking someone who probably killed somebody to, to rob from them. Okay. And Luke mentions this, and this is the only gospel that does mention um, about this, about these thieves, about the one who basically is mocking him with everybody else. And then the other one, it just kind of comes to his senses. I think of the prodigal son He came to himself. And it's like this other thief finally came to himself and realized what was going on. And he's looking at him. He's saying, I know this guy is innocent. He may have actually heard Jesus at some point in his life, but rejected it. Now he's regretting it. But he now realizes, I do have this one last chance. And so instead of mocking Jesus, he goes to him, remember me when you get to your kingdom. God, Jesus, help me. I'm not ready to die. And Jesus basically said, you will be with me in paradise. Didn't say much more because he couldn't. Forgiveness at the point of death. For those, there are many groups that think, well, you have to be baptized in order to be saved. This single incident shows that that is a fallacy. Because there was no way. And Jesus didn't say, okay, you got to get off that cross. You got to get baptized first. And then I'll think about it. No. Jesus said it. You are being. You're, you're going to be with me. You are going to be with me. The Greek word translated as paradise is a Persian loan word. And it symbolizes a place of beauty and peace. Okay. It's used elsewhere in scripture to refer to the Garden of Eden. And it refers also to the future bliss that the garden, that garden symbolizes that we see in the book of Revelation. This man was saved by grace. He didn't deserve it. And for a while he didn't want it. But now he got it. That act of faith. Jesus, you can do something about this. should be noted, and what we're going to do, we're not going to be able to finish the whole crucifixion at this point. should be noted that the people at Calvary fulfilled Old Testament, or the people, all the people at Calvary fulfilled Old Testament prophecy and what they did, every single one of them. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to, uh, I want you to, I'm going to hold my place here in Luke. I'm going to go to Psalm 22. 
If you want to follow me, fine, but I'm going to go through this quickly. Psalm 22 was a prophecy about the afflictions of the coming Messiah, describing pretty much a lot of what we're talking about right now. So let me, let me start with verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. In the night season, and am not silent, but you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men despised by the people. Okay, note that verse. Know what they did with him. They spit on him. They ridiculed him. Even when he was on the cross, they were screaming at him. And what were they screaming? Let's look at verse 7 in Psalm 22. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake their heads saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Other gospels quote that verse directly as, as, as these leaders are mocking Jesus with these words right out of Psalm 22. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Be not far from me. For trouble is near, there, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. Here's another thing. Remember we talked about dislocated bones? And all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a posture. My tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. He's describing thirst. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all of my bones. And they look and stare at me. And they divide my garments among them. For my clothing they cast All this was described here in Luke. All this prophecy. Like, for example, gambling. What was happening? Well, they, it was tradition. The Roman soldiers, they, and again, despite church art or the movies, they were crucified naked. They were wearing nothing. Okay? It was part of the humiliation of the execution. So they had no further need for the clothes, so the soldiers divided the clothes among themselves. But Jesus had this one robe, it's a very well-made robe, probably one of the women made it for him, uh, and they didn't have a seam, so they looked at it, they said, hey, that's not, you know, let's not rip it apart, it's too nice. Well, who wants it? Hey, I got a pair of dice, let's cast lots for it. You know, this is for the pastor's jacket, boom, here we go, seven, seven, there. They probably played their game, and whoever won got, got the robe, just like it says in Psalm 22. God knew what was happening. He was, this was not child abuse. God was in control and still on the throne. Amen. We're going to stop here because we've you know, kind of started late and got go, we're going too late and there's a lot more. But we'll pick up on verse 44 next week. So I'll save my conclusion for then because there's a lot going on here. But I'm hoping, I'm praying when I wrote this, I was praying that you have a better understanding of what Jesus went through. I mean, you think about, you know, he's got his bare back, wounds on his back against a wood with splinters going in it. I know every single one of you have experienced a splinter at some point, and it does not feel good. Okay. But compared to what Jesus is going through... At least you get an idea what it's like. Okay? And there's nothing he could have done about it. But here's the point. There was nothing he was going to do about it. Amen. Because love placed him there. Because the price had to be paid. And so next week we'll, we'll, we'll continue on here. Father, we thank you again for this, this view into the crucifixion. We ask you, Father, also to just... 
keep our mind in what the crucifixion was all about. And as we go into communion, Father, that's what we're supposed to do. To remember the sacrifice that was made for our sins. Because, Father, you knew, you were just, you knew that you could not face an unrighteous person. But you loved us so much that you were willing to put the sins of the world on an innocent man so that that penalty for sin was not only paid, it was paid in full. That we never had to do anything else except accept that gift of grace and then we would spend eternity with you. And as we go into communion now, Father, we ask you to bless our time as we come together as believers, as brothers and sisters in Christ. Because, Father, we love you. Maybe not as much as you love us because I don't think we can, but we love you with our, all our hearts, all our puny little human hearts can do. Because you are our God, our creator, our savior, in Jesus' name. So as we pass out uh, the elements, hold on to them. We're going to take them together. And as we are, you know, we have a, a song of, 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 of communion here. Think about what we've just read about the goings-ons of a crucifixion, all those injuries. And ultimately, and we're going to see this next week, Jesus this crucifixion didn't kill him. He gave his own life up. He said, into, he said to God, into my hands I commit my spirit. No one, no one could take his life, but he could surrender. And despite all that he went through, he still kept his eyes on the goal. Wanted it or not, whether it is or not. So those are going to help out with me.